So namaste and welcome to everyone. We have Sri Ram Rajagopal with us one more time to take a few questions that we received during our session held on Friday, Love Heals. Sri Ram, thank you for taking out the time again and uh, we'll dive right in with the first question, which was, we received actually a lot of questions and a lot of them were on how to find the right soulmate, whether the soulmate has already pre-decided. So what would you say about that? All right. Thank you, Nina. Atma Namaste to Nina. Atma Namaste to all of you. So thank you, all of you who watch the session, who continue to watch the session, and who are sending in your questions. So let's start. First of all, what's a soulmate? If you ask me when I'm in a slightly mad mood, I would say when you put your foot against the foot of another person, that's your soulmate. Bad joke. But anyway. <laughs> now... There are many different definitions. I'm sure when some of you read books, you come across different uh, terms, like I've heard of terms like twin souls and all of that. When I, when I look at the term soulmate, it, for me, it brings up the concept of a certain individual with whom I'm going to have a connection in this lifetime and a connection in a romantic sense. So either that person is your partner, your significant other, your husband or your wife. For me, that would be soulmate. I'm sure in another level, you can consider, let's say your best friend as a soulmate in a different sense, or you could consider your family as soulmates. But for the purpose of this discussion, I'm going to restrict the, the definition of soulmate to the soul with whom you have a life purpose to fulfill. And that life purpose is going to be fulfilled through a, a, a loving relationship, through not a platonic, but a loving relationship. Okay. Now, first thing I must address is in my understanding, and I must confess in my experience, you don't necessarily have just one soulmate in your life. My understanding of this is that all the relationships we go through have a certain karma involved. There are certain karmas to work out with that person. There are certain lessons that we can learn and grow through together. Certain lessons that person has to teach me, certain lessons I have to teach that person. So, I was thinking about this earlier and I was thinking about best friends. I'm sure all of us remember the best friend we had in school. And when we graduated, we believed that we couldn't survive without that best friend. And yet few years later, when you're in college, maybe you're even out of touch with that best friend of school. And now you have a best friend in college. And same thing when you, when you graduate from college, sometimes you lose touch with that best friend. And then as an adult, you have another best friend. So it isn't necessary that the best friend has to be the same person throughout your life. There could be different people who fulfill that role of best friend at different phases. And I find that in some cases, not all, you have a similar situation with soulmates, where you have a certain soulmate with whom you have a very strong connection, a lot of learning, a lot of growth, a lot of love, maybe sometimes a lot of fighting and a lot of uh, challenges, but we grow through these experiences. And sometimes that relationship doesn't always last forever. Sometimes after a certain point, the relationship ends. Now, in one of our subsequent questions, we'll actually address this, the topic of ending of a relationship, because some people seem to feel that if you end the relationship, somehow you're running away from that karma. And the way I understood Master Chua to explain it, that's not necessarily true. But we'll come to that later. So sometimes a relationship with that soulmate ends and you meet another soulmate. Now, for example, I've been through relationships before I got married. And I definitely do consider, you know, um, at least one of those relationships a soulmate. And if you ask me then, if that was your soulmate, how come the relationship ended? Looking back, there was a certain objective to us being together at that time. For example, I can honestly tell you right now that if I had not been through that relationship, I would not have gone through the experiences that I went through. I would not have learned certain lessons that I learned being in a relationship, which helped me to learn and grow and change in ways that allowed my current relationship, that allowed my relationship with my wife today to manifest the way it has. You know, you know let, let me give you an example. When, when, when we're in a, let's say in a, in a dating phase, if you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, if you're feeling in a crappy mood, you can just call off your date and go back home. When you're married, you can't do that. Going back home, you have to face that person. You're probably going to face them, you know, sleep in the same bed as them. 
it takes a certain learning and as and as we expressed in our previous session communication takes effort you have to communicate about how you're going to communicate you have to set expectations i found that that earlier relationship helped me to learn and grow in many ways about what it is to be in a relationship what it is to have an adult connection with another individual what it is to communicate what it is to be understanding a lot of things and that growth help me to change in ways that helps me to manifest who i am today as a husband so that for me that was a soulmate there was a relationship that manifested there was an objective and a purpose and then we went apart now some of you ask but if it's your soulmate why did you move apart because sometimes after that journey together for a few years each individual has a journey to take which needs to be taken independently it's like your best friend i think sometimes the concept of marriage is forever which is a great concept i'm not saying no or happily ever after becomes so strong that we somehow assume that a relationship that ends is a failure now in my experience in my understanding that's not necessarily true sometimes a relationship ending is like a graduation ceremony you've both been through and learned what you needed to learn and go through and now you're moving ahead you're moving on to the next phase of uh, your life which may involve a different partner so that that's my personal take on the concept of a uh, soulmate and we'll address in a little bit uh, the actually from what you've said right now there are a couple of few you know other things that come up in fact someone has asked this question about karma that once you finish the karma does that friendship or does that relationship necessarily have to end that's one question that has been hmm. put up uh the second thing uh, about uh, like you said if i'm not wrong i remember master saying somewhere that it's never a failure nothing good or bad is ever a failure it's just a stepping stone to learn and move forward so probably it's the attitude uh, uh that would make a difference on how you look Absolutely. at it as a failure or not so but we still have that question about you know how to find your soulmate that is a, a big question still so 100% before we move on to anything yeah. else the attitude is definitely true and i will address that under i think the next question as well because that is important i agree with what you said and what master says that it's it's not a failure everything is a learning process everything is an experience i think for me the question comes did i learn all that i could through that experience or are, is there still something left to learn now, of course on one level there's always something left to learn but on another level maybe i could have learned more or grown more through that so we'll address that we'll address that in a few in a little while but with regards to how to find a soulmate so again for me the term soul in this in the phrase soulmate implies for me personally that this is a person an individual a soul whose life purpose whose life journey and your life journey somehow intersect at a certain point and therefore being with that person is a part of your soul's journey or as we would say it, it's a part of your destiny and being with you is a part of their destiny so if you say what do i have to do to meet my soulmate one answer is you don't have to do anything it's in your destiny to meet that person so you will meet them however we also know that a person can go against their destiny now some people might say wait a minute if it's your destiny what what do you mean by saying you can go against it master said we have free will that's what differentiates a human being we have the free will to follow through with our destiny we have the free will to exceed it even we have the free will to go against it so for me while on one hand i can say it is our destiny to meet our soulmate on another hand you have to qualify it by saying as long as you're going ahead with your life's purpose you're going to fulfill you're going to meet your soulmate now of course the next question will be how do i know i'm fulfilling my life's purpose what how do i know what my destiny is so let's give two answers to that number one from a spiritual perspective we are all souls and we incarnate to learn and grow and this learning and growth in a very simplistic way can be can be simplified and say that the soul grows as a being of light as a being of love as a being of power those of you with a background in 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 uh, in india you know that these three qualities of the soul are referred to in sanskrit as sat chit and ananda so it's an ancient teaching so the soul incarnates to develop these three qualities so from one perspective as long as i live my life in a way that is working towards enhancing these qualities the quality of light or intelligence the quality of love the quality of power or will as long as i'm living in my life in a way that enhances these three qualities i'm working towards my life's purpose and that does not have to include giving up everything going living in a mountain that's a very common misconception 
you fulfill your life's purpose as a husband, as a wife, as a parent, as a business owner, as a, as a professional, as a doctor, whatever it is you're doing in your life, that's part of your life's journey. Just as being in a certain family, getting married to a certain person or getting into a relationship with a person, that's part of your life's journey. It's part of your soul's purpose. So for me, one answer is as long as I'm living my life, doing whatever I do in my life to try and enhance these three qualities of the soul, I'm working towards my life purpose. And part of that life purpose would include that soulmate coming into my life. So that's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it, going back to Master's teachings, the meditation on twin hearts. So as we mentioned in the previous session, when you practice the meditation on twin hearts, it generates a lot of loving energies in your aura. And that loving energy is magnetic. It attracts the person. Another benefit of the meditation on twin hearts, which is talked about in one of Master's courses is, Regular practice of the meditation on twin hearts helps a person get more aligned with their life's purpose. So some of you are saying, I'm still not sure. How do I know I'm following my life's purpose? Practice the meditation regularly. With certain benefits of the meditation, which we won't go into here, with the greater guidance that comes down from the soul, from God, it's a greater alignment with your life's purpose. So once again, as you're more aligned, the soulmate comes into your life. It just happens. So I would say, how, don't, don't worry about finding the soulmate. Do your part, the soulmate will come. You know, it's like the saying, when, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. When the soul is ready, the mate appears. Something like that. <laughs> yes. And it's, it's also, I think part of it, we master covers it so beautifully also in the Achieving Oneness class, which is uh, uh, also all about finding and following your purpose in life. What is the purpose that we are born for? Um, let's move to the next question. So once you do find a soulmate, hopefully, and then you do get married, and then, like we said, especially if it's marriage, it's a long-term relationship. So one of the questions that we got is that when you have a partner or even a marriage for a long-term relationship, how do you keep that spark alive? We spoke in the last session about, you know, that initial phase of falling in love. But then after that, you have to still go back and then you start looking at things. So how does one keep that spark alive in a long-term relationship? All right. That, that's, a, that's a good question, I think. Now, here's the thing. Master Cho used to make us do this experiment very often. And I'm going to ask all of you who are watching to do this. So he used to say, keep your hands like this. Keep your hands apart. Move them back and forth. And he'd ask us, do you feel any friction? And of course, the answer was no. Then he'd say, put them together. Rub them together. Do you feel friction? And of course, the answer is yes. He said, that's life. When two or more people come together, there's bound to be friction. That's, that's the nature of how we are right now. So he said, it's not a matter of getting rid of the friction, but it's a matter of putting in the right lubricant. And he used to say the lubricant is love. He says, when you have enough love in the relationship, now this could be any relationship, but we're talking about a soulmate relationship or a significant other relationship, love becomes a lubricant. So then the friction is substantially reduced. So how do you, how do you generate more love? Because as you rightly said, Nina, last time we spoke about the falling in love phase, but we also covered how after that initial excitement and passion and, and all of that phase goes over, the true love begins, which, is, which takes effort. And I think one of the key factors in a relationship is not to take the other person for granted. And that's, that's tough. You know, I remember um, my wife and I had, had spent a couple of years together. We knew each other or we thought we knew each other quite well before we got married. And yet once we got married about six or seven months later, I remember we were having a discussion and interestingly, she expressed the feeling that she was being taken for granted by me. And I expressed the same feeling that I was being taken for granted for by her. So it isn't a conscious decision to take the other person for granted, but I think maybe we tend to settle into certain comfortable patterns of behavior. Maybe we're not making that extra effort anymore. Could be something simple. When you come home from a long trip, maybe in the initial days, your partner will actually uh, you know, check where you are and open the door for you. And later on, you know, the partner is watching TV. It's, oh, hi, you're back. It doesn't have to be a huge, magnificent gesture. Those are great. It's the little things. It's the little things that make a difference. So as we said last time, something as simple as expressing appreciation for your partner, one thing a day, that will make a huge difference. 
expressing gratitude. That is something you acknowledge in your life that your partner gives you. That's another difference. Another factor is consciously making time for each other. Because I think sometimes, even though we may be together, we're together, but we reach in our own world. I'm on my phone, you're on your phone, or even if you're watching a TV, I think time when we can actually talk without distractions, spend time with the other person, not spend time with my mobile phone with the other person, spend time with the other person, talk. Now, of course, this brings up questions in the last session. What if my husband or wife doesn't want to talk? So there we talked about the energy work you can do, the blessing you can do. But now let's assume you've got those techniques making time to talk about things, just about fun things, simple things. Otherwise, sometimes we get into this relationship where all that we talk about is, let's say those of you who are parents, you're talking about your children, their future and money and my job and your job. It's all, it's all work or stress related. Talk about fun things, watch a sunset together. You know, many years ago when I was talking to a therapist, he was sharing with me how, from a psychology point of view, and Nina, please add into this because this is your area, but he drew the father and the mother as two circles. And he said the connection between the father and the mother is symbolized by three lines between them. So, you know, father circle, mother circle, three lines. And then he drew another circle down here, which is either the son or the daughter. He says in a healthy relationship, after having the son or the daughter, the three lines continue between the father and the mother, but now from the father, there are two lines to the son or the daughter. From the mother, there are two lines to the son or the daughter. And the numbers are significant, three, two, two. He says, what it is supposed to symbolize is, as a man, my connection to my wife is still the, my primary focus. That's why it's three lines. Now, I might say, what about the son or the daughter? They get left out. No, remember, though they receive only two lines from me, they're also receiving two lines from the mother. So it's like they have four lines of connection. And he says the problem in many marriages, many relationships, especially within certain cultures, is that after a certain point, instead of three lines between the man and the woman, it becomes two or becomes one. And then when the child comes up, it becomes two or three or four lines. So it's like the son or the daughter almost replaces that significant other in your life. And that leads to an unhealthy uh, focus of the son and the parent. It leads to a lack of connection between the two parents. So I think that's something we need to try and focus on that just because we have children, and yes, huge blessing, but do not forget each other. And this is not my teaching. This is from psychologists. Anina, I'd like you to add In something fact, to this it is piece. True. It is true. And, uh, and uh, someone has asked that question that we don't have time to invest in each other because we are so busy taking care of our children or of our parents who are living together sometimes in a joint family. And uh, even as a counselor, we do say that, that you have to... You know, there's that whole poem from Khalil Gibran that your children are through you, but they're not yours. You have to learn to let go. And I think it also brings in that whole need to be needed. So if I'm not going to be needed, if my children can do without me, then I'm no longer important. So again, part of, I think, the greatest learning for me also as a parent has been practicing that self-love, that even though I'm there for my family, I'm there for my children, for my mother, everyone, but then I still need some me time and some time for, I'm assuming that would also be there exactly for a couple. You need your me time as a couple to be able to give them that healthy, positive vibe when you're with them. So uh, I think taking out time, as you said, is very important. Even if it's just maybe enjoying a cup of tea on the terrace, watching the sunset, but those 15, 20 minutes a day at least are important for sure. It really so, does. Sridhar, really that does, yeah. actually. Um, Sorry, that maybe just to... make a date night with your husband or wife. Yes, with without anyone else. Or... Yeah. And I think one of the advantages, many of our viewers are from India, one of the advantages, we still do have a family backup. Many people do have a family backup. So maybe find a relative you can leave your son or daughter with and go and spend time with each other. I think the challenge is many couples, especially the ones I've spoken to sometimes feel guilty about doing this. But I think that's where the whole connection between husband and wife comes in. That connection needs to be strong and a strong foundation for your children to then develop on. So spending time with your partner, with your husband, with your wife is not something to feel guilty about. It's something that's good for you, for your husband or wife, and for your children. So I think that's something people could look at. And then one more point you added, self-love. If I don't feel worthy of being loved, then no matter how much the other person tries, I'm going to feel somehow unworthy. Or I might even dismiss the person because I'm feeling awkward about the attention or the love or the affection they're showering upon me. So self-love is another massive topic 
that needs to be looked at but that's that's a whole new discussion on some other day no but that what i was saying is that it's the it's the techniques in the school that you know made us aware that this is where i'm lacking and this is what i need to Absolutely. cultivate and as i use the techniques to cultivate that things started changing Love so that, that is the beauty of how i think the school's teachings because um most schools will talk about okay don't get stressed don't do this how not to actually get stressed how not to actually do certain practices i think that awareness came in this step by step techniques that you know must show us so beautifully uh, shared in such a simple manner so for me i think that is one of the biggest uh, things that i'm grateful for in the school so um, let me reverse roles as the interviewer now could you share with our viewers so what are some of the techniques you think they could uh, practice uh, yes some of them may not be pranic healers but what are some of the techniques you feel they could practice i think the the regular practice of simple awareness every day that the, the techniques that we use to just become aware of certain things happening in our life mm -hmm. and also like you said the meditation on twin hearts so as the heart starts opening you do become more sensitive to a lot of things that earlier on you would just push under the carpet maybe mm. so that brought in that awareness but i'm not going to let you change roles here <laughs> i am bring back to, to the hot seat yes put you back there so it's uh, you know also another question that came up with i think where you're talking about love being the lubricant is why do we get irritated with people we don't want to hurt them but we end up hurting the people who are closest to us so how does one avoid hurting the people not only getting hurt from them but also hurting them in turn and um, how does maybe healing or maybe the twin hearts meditation help us from preventing hurt at either side of the table this this is a very good uh, point as well now of course i would go back again and refer all of us to the things like establishing proper communication expectations all of that can lead to hurting another person or being hurt but another simple factor is quite often when we get upset or stressed at home maybe we are shouting at somebody in the house maybe a spouse or a child if we think about it our stress or anger or irritation is not towards them it's towards something that may have happened in the office that day but because in the office environment we're not able to say anything we have to smile and be polite we bottle up those negative emotions and then when you come home it has to be released so it gets released at the slightest trigger and i'm sure when we calm down we realize that actually the way i responded was not fair because i was not actually angry at my son or my daughter i was angry at what happened in the meeting i took it out on my son or daughter so again one of the things masachua teaches us is just as we said in the talk love is an energy anger is an energy stress is an energy so masachua says these are energies you can release using techniques like meditation and pranic healing and once you release them then it doesn't have to get released by shouting and screaming it's released through the energy techniques so masachua used to say let's say your husband or your wife you know has had a stressful day and you know when they come home because of their stress they're likely to react or get angry and then it creates a problem masachua said you can actually heal them before they come home or on their way home you can actually heal them now that's that's on a on a basis of healing somebody else now if you know certain healing techniques first thing you do when you go home is actually practice certain simple techniques a super simple technique is having a bath with water and salt that's it right and uh, those of you watching if you don't know how to do this simplest way get a bucket or a bathtub if it's a bucket put in a couple of handfuls of salt any kind of salt will do sometimes people ask what kind of salt if it's a bathtub you may need one or two or three kilos of salt soak in the bathtub for about maybe 5 minutes or the bucket of water pour it over yourself this is the simplest way there are other ways now why salt water masachua says salt helps to disintegrate these negative energies and if you try it i've heard feedback from hundreds of people you try this maybe every evening just for a few weeks you will be a different person you come home exhausted you have the salt water bath and suddenly you feel you're ready to start the day so simple salt water bath doesn't take time simple breathing exercises right in the basic pranic healing course master chua teaches us certain simple breathing exercises which again clean the aura clean the chakras energize us so when the aura chakras get clean there's a lot of de-stressing that takes place when you get energized you don't feel exhausted that helps healing would definitely help for those of you who know how to heal healing of yourself healing of your partner and going back regular meditation on twin hearts why 
when the heart chakra, which is one of the two chakras we focus on in the meditation, when that gets activated, it starts regulating other chakras that are connected with emotions like stress, irritability, anger, frustration, all those emotions. So when my heart chakra is bigger, even though I go through a stressful experience in the office, I'm able to deal with it. The problem is not stress. The problem is stress that I'm not able to handle when it becomes overwhelming. So with a bigger heart chakra, with a bigger aura, I'm able to handle that stressful situation and I don't need to come home and explode. Plus all the other things you've spoken about. So I would say these are simple tools, as you rightly said, Nina, a little while ago, the teachings of GMCKS that are such a simple, practical impact on relationships. And, and what's beautiful, I think, is the fact that as we change, and I think, you know, the, the sum total of energies in a home, uh, it's like in a dish, if you change one ingredient, the taste changes. So if we change, our energy changes, the energy of the home has to change. The energy of other people will, in the long run, undergo oh, Absolutely, change. absolutely. You know, last year during the lockdown, it's been a tough year for many people, but I think one of the blessings and that many people talk about that I experienced is that we were able to do a lot of work online. And there was a time when we were doing regular meditation every day and blessing our home, blessing our family. We got a lot of feedback from people who are saying, you know, I'm meditating every day online with the group. My family isn't, but I'm seeing a change in my home. I'm seeing a change in my grandmother. I'm seeing a change in my wife, in my husband. So absolutely, you change the energy in your aura, in your home changes, your family changes. Absolutely. So I know we have said half an hour, so I'm going to take on, I'm going to jump to the last question actually. And it was about, yes, we understand that. I re remember that you spoke about uh, how this lady was able to save her marriage through the techniques of blessing. And you know, when she stopped, uh, again, issues started in her relationship. But what if a relationship is really not working out? There are children involved. And like that whole question we spoke of right in the beginning, that if you give up on a relationship, is it like running away from karma? Or uh, what is the, because of course, especially if there are children involved, then the impact is a lot bigger. There are other lives involved. So one question is, if you break off a relationship, which is not working out, is it like running away from karma? And will you still have to face something like that again? The other is, how do you deal with something like that when you have children involved? What is the best way to go about it? Yeah, this, this, is, a, this, is, a, this is a tricky question in a sense because each relationship is different, each family is different. To generalize a certain extent, and I would just request our listeners to please remember, this is a general answer, each, each of you is different, but if you're in an abusive relationship, I would definitely say you need to move out. There's no point staying in that abusive relationship, especially the abuse is not just towards you, but towards your children and saying there's karma to be worked out. You need to protect yourself. You need to look after yourself. You need to look after your children. So I think there's a practical aspect always to Master Chua's teachings. Now, assuming it's not to that extent of abuse, but the relationship is not going anywhere. Those of you who've done sessions with me, you know, my common, my most, most uh, common answer is uh, why. So, why are you leaving the relationship? For me, that would be the question. What, what's the reason for leaving the relationship? If I'm leaving because of anger, irritation, frustration, now I'm not saying that's not a valid reason, but what's to ensure that in the next relationship, I'm not going to be triggered again and feel angry or irritated or frustrated again. And that's why we notice sometimes these patterns recurring. I'm sure all of us have a friend who, let's say, got into a relationship, had a certain kind of problem. They broke it off, next relationship, same kind of problem. Broke it off, third relationship, same kind of problem. For me, that's a clear indication that there's a certain lesson this person needs to learn because until you learn that lesson, the pattern will keep repeating. But on the other hand, if I've learned that lesson, the pattern does not repeat. So for me, the question is not whether divorce is okay or breaking off a relationship is okay. For me, the question is, what are the circumstances under which I'm breaking it off? Have I learned the lesson that I need to learn from this person? For, and, and that's always going to be difficult. You might say, how do I know? And that's a tough question. But that's why for me, for example, when you're, if you decide to leave a relationship, make sure you're not leaving it with a lot of anger, hatred, and then lack of forgiveness, because then you're going to carry that burden with you. But if you can 
at least internally. Remember last time in the talk, we also spoke about inner forgiveness, outer forgiveness. So breaking off the relationship could be an aspect of outer forgiveness that, sorry, internally I've forgiven, out, outwardly, sorry, I'm done. But at least internally, can I acknowledge or can I honestly say that, yes, I've forgiven you, whatever has happened has happened. You made mistakes, I made mistakes, Atma Namaste, go in peace, but I don't want anything to do with you. Then you're leaving with a certain peace, with a certain disconnect, you're able to let go and move on. For me, that from a very generic, general uh, description would be a healthy way of leaving as opposed to fighting, shouting, screaming. Now, certainly we don't want to leave in a way that creates more problems. Now to give an example, I've heard of certain couples undergoing divorce where sometimes for legal purposes, it is recommended that they make a certain complaint against the husband or they make a certain complaint about the wife, which may not even necessarily be true. That for me would definitely not be ideal because you're generating more negative karma through maybe lack of honesty. So we need to make sure that, first of all, the reason I'm leaving is because I feel I'm done, but there's internal forgiveness. The method that I follow to leave is also one that follows the virtues that Master Chua teaches. So and you have an understanding, okay, this person is not the right person for me. You're a good person. I'm a good person. You have your weaknesses. I have my weaknesses. Right now, it's not ideal for us to be together. Atma Namaste, go in peace. Now that's tough. But again, I would say I've, I've been through this with master's techniques. It can be done. It can be done. Um, yeah. So I would say that's one of the key factors. So, and of course, children does make it more complicated. I know certain families where they actually decide either one or both partners to stay together at least until the children reach a certain age. Maybe they, they get, get leave for college. Maybe in some families until they become adults. So that's also a personal choice you may make that, you know, it's okay, I'll, it's been so many years, I can manage another three, four years for the sake of the children. Others might say, no, listen, you know, I think even for the children it's better, especially the home environment is, is really not pleasant to say, let's, let's separate. The separation and the divorce has issues for the children, but in the long run, it's going to be healthier for them to be in a happy home environment, even if it's with the parents one by one. So I think there are a lot of factors. And, you know, Nina, you, again, as, as, a, as a parent, as a counselor, I think, you know, I would like to hear your inputs on this also, how, how to no, it's handle like, it. I think I, I, I use the answer that you use most often, not just the why, it depends. So that, that's the favorite thing. It, every case is different, but I do think that understanding the fact that love does heal and everything that you're doing even being firm out of love uh, you know kind of brings down or mellows down any kind of hurt so whether it's for the children whether it's for yourself whether it's for the other person knowing that you're still acting from a place of love like you said inner forgiveness out of forgiveness doing the right thing by myself doing the right thing for my children doing the right thing also towards the other person because sometimes the other person needs to be handled in a firm manner, but there's no need for rudeness. There's no need for uh, dishonesty and you know, going that way. That definitely helps. And there again, I say that Master Shoah's techniques have helped because they help you see that. They help you see that uh, you don't want to develop more karma. You don't want to uh, entangle yourself further. So what I really like about the teachings are they give you techniques to disentangle and look at things from a very objective point of view. So in my personal life, I've also been a single parent. I've, I've been able to use those techniques. Uh, I don't know what I would have done without them, for sure. So it's been a great uh, learning from that point of view. And I think this topic of relationships can really go on and on and on. There's so much to talk about. There's so much to discuss. But like we promised, we'll stick to half an hour. And I think my time's up. So Lovely. thank you again for thank taking you. out this time for answering those extra questions. To all those who are watching, to all those who sent us your questions, thank you very much. We'll have a lot more conversations like this. Do share, you can go on to the uh, website, look up schedules, you can follow us on Facebook and on Instagram to stay updated and tuned for more of these sessions. Thanks a lot again, Sriram. Of course, a thank big, you, big thank you to Master Chua Kok Sui. For and to all, all of our viewers and the marketing together. team. I, I, I want to just leave our viewers with one last thought. You don't have to have the person you're working with in your life right now. It could be an ex-husband, ex-wife, could be somebody who's passed away. 
the beauty of the energetic techniques is the energy you're sending the person doesn't just go to the physical body of the person it goes to their soul so i've heard sometimes people coming in saying you know this person had a difficult relationship with they passed away and i'm still feeling guilty or i'm still feeling affected you know what after the meditation send the energy to that person they they could be somebody you don't even who's alive but you don't know where they live you're not in touch with them you don't want to get in touch with them you just want to be free of that past could be somebody who's passed away from the physical body but there's certain unfinished work with them use the techniques send the energy to that person's soul send the energy to that person regardless of where they are it still works so it, the techniques are really not limited by location not limited even by the person's presence in a physical body they're really incredible and i think the reason both nina and i are so passionate about this and many of us is because we've tried them we've seen that it works so as she I said we should all of the best sorry virtual technology i love that term it's it's yes. such a beautiful thing Thank and uh, yeah it's i think because we are so we've experienced it we speak from the heart and we can you know we are, we can go on and on about these things so but thank you again thank shriram you. Thank, thank you to all the viewers and atma namaste atma namaste